Okay, I will be reading Chapter 2 from Paul Bond's Archaeology, a very short introduction. Studying the past is of little point if you don't know how old things are, or at least which ones are older than others. No amount of enthusiasm for the subject can substitute for a solid chronology. It's no use having the inclination if you haven't got the time. So how do archaeologists get dates? Until fairly recently, there were only two ways of establishing a chronolo chronology. Relative dating, which does not mean going out with your cousin, and historical dating. Relative dating simply involves placing things, objects, deposits, events, cultures, into a sequence, some being younger than others, some being older. Historical dates come from periods from which there is written evidence, such as medieval or Roman times. For prehistory, only relative dating was available. So, although one could tell that the Bronze Age preceded the Iron Age, and that the Stone Age was earlier than Bronze, one had no idea by how much. The basic reasoning behind relative dating came from stratigraphy, the study of how layers or deposits occur one above the other. By and large, the underlying le level was laid down first and therefore predates the overlying layer. And the same applies to objects found within these layers unless there have been some disturbance, for example, by burrowing animals or grave digging rubbish pits, or erosion and redeposition. There are ways of finding out if the bones in a layer are of the same age by chemical dating. Over time, a buried bone's nitrogen content declines, and it gradually absorbs fluorine and uranium. So measuring these elements will indicate if a group of bones are contemporaneous or of different time periods. This was the method used in the early 50s to expose the Piltdown fraud a supposed missing link between apes and humans found in Sussex in 1912, but proved to be a complete hoax. Chemical dating showed that the skull was recent, and the jaw was from a modern orangutan. They had been stained and the teeth filed to make them look old and convincing. Debate raged for decades, vociferously and tediously, about who or who was or were responsible for this prank, with candidates including Tellard de Chardin, and even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but virtually everyone now agrees it was Charles Dawson, the discoverer of the finds, as he was also involved in other archaeological frauds. The other major archaeological kind of relative dating is typology, the grouping of objects into types which share the same attributes of material, shape, and or decoration. The whole system rests on two basic ideas. First, that objects from a given time and place share a recognizable style, like goes with like, and that changes in style are fairly gradual. In actual fact, different styles can coexist. Individual styles can last a long time, and changes can occur quite fast. But the good thing about short introductory books is that there's no room to go into such complications. In any case, generations of archaeologists, most notably those from Germanic countries, devoted their lives to establishing detailed sequences of pot, tool, and weapon forms and then trying to connect the sequences from different regions. Whole collections of different but contemporaneous objects can be lumped together in an assemblage, and assemblages too can be arranged in sequences and compared from area to area. Other relative chronologies were based on the succession of climactic phases for the Ice Age, glacials, or phases of glacial advance, interglacials, or warmer interludes, and minor fluctuations known as stadials and interstadials. But we now know, thanks to detailed climactic information from ice cores in the Arctic and Antarctic, that Ice Age climate was far more complex and fluctuating than we had realized. Pollen from deposits also produces sequences of climactic and vegetational change, but these tend to be fairly localized. And faunal dating, based on the presence of bones of different animal species, was also an important method, particularly for the Pleistocene archaeology, the study of the last ice age, as cold and warm species came and went with climatic and environmental changes. Producing sequences is all very well, but calendar dates, absolute dates, are what archaeologists have always craved. Until the late 20th century, the only dates available were those obtained from archaeological connections with the chronologies and calendars established by ancient peoples. And these are still of huge importance today. Many of these calendars, such as the Romans, Egyptians, Chinese, etc., were based on the years of 
rule of their consuls, emperors, kings, or dynasties. The Egyptian dynasties, for example, can be dated by working back from the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, which from Greek historians we know took place in 332 BC. Further detail and clarification came from Egyptian records of astronomical events whose dates we also know from independent scientific sources. The Maya of Mesoamerica had an extremely elaborate calendar, which was based not on rulers or dynasties, but on cycles of 260 and 365 days, and a long count starting in August 3113 BC by our own system. This all gives archaeologists the chance to date certain objects, such as inscriptions referring to events or rulers, and of course coins of the Roman and medieval periods that carry the name of the current ruler. One always has to bear in mind, of course, that dating the object does not necessarily date the layer in which it was found. A coin can be passed around or hoarded for decades or centuries, but it does at least give you a maximum age for the layer. It can't be older than the date on the coin, unless the coin is intrusive, but it could be much younger. Apart from these historical and calendrical ages, archaeology was helpless until scientists presented it with a whole series of ways to obtain absolute dates from different materials. A fairly firm chronology has been science's great, greatest gift to archaeology. As is well known, there's no present like the time. Before the war, only two very localized techniques were available, the varves of Scandinavia and the tree rings of the American Southwest. Varves is a Swedish term for the clay deposits laid down annually by melting ice sheets. They vary in thickness from year to year, with a warm year causing increased melting and hence a thick layer. By measuring the successive thickness of a series and comparing it with patterns in other areas, long sequences can be linked together that stretch back thousands of years. Exactly the same is true of the annual growth ring in trees. A sequence of thicker and thinner rings caused by local, local climactic fluctuations can be built up by overlapping samples from trees of different ages. We now have unbroken sequences stretching back to 8000 BC in Germany, for example, with which ancient timbers can be compared and their age pinpointed. Naturally, this technique is most applicable in areas like the American Southwest, where the aridity has preserved lots of ancient wood, or in Northwest Europe, where waterlogged timbers are abundant in boggy regions. Results of amazing precision are now emerging. In Britain, for example, analysis of timber from a plank walkway known as Sweet Track in Somerset, constructed across a swamp, suggests that it was built during the winter of 3807 and 3806 BC. The tree ring method is also of immense value in acting as a means of checking dates obtained from radiocarbon, the method which revolutionized archaeology but which also proved too good to be true in a sense. Samples consist of organic materials from archaeological sites, such as charcoal, wood, seeds, and human or animal bones. Because the method measured the tiny amount of the radioactive isotope carbon-14, C14, left in organic substances, having absorbed it throughout their lives, they steadily lose it after they die. In a development known as the Accelerator Mass Spectro Spectrometry, AMS, only very tiny samples are required and the atoms of C14 are counted directly. The limit of reliable dates is still about 50,000 years. The basic assumption behind the radiocarbon method that the concentration of C14 in the atmosphere has always been constant eventually proved to be false, and we now know that it has been varied throughout time, largely due to changes in the Earth's magnetic field. If the method had been tested on tree rings of known age, things might have gone more smoothly from the start and these awkward problems ironed out. Plotting radiocarbon ages, ages against tree ring ages has led to the production of calibration curves, graphs that show the change in degrees of error in C14 dates over time, back just about 7000 BCE. Despite all these uncertainties and the ever-present dangers of contamination of samples, radiocarbon dating has become archaeology's most useful and ubiquitous tool, establishing chronologies for areas which previously lacked timescales of any kind. It can be used anywhere, regardless of climate, as long as there is organic material available. But what happens if no organic material survives in a site? Until recently, this would have destroyed any hope of obtaining a date, but not anymore, thanks to the wonders of modern science. For early sites, such as those in East Africa with fossil humans, the potassium-argon method can date rocks in volcanic areas. 
Elsewhere, uranium series dating can be applied to rocks rich in calcium carbonate, such as stalagmite and caves. Thermoluminescence dating can be used on pottery, the most abundant inorganic material on archaeological sites of the last 10,000 years, and other inorganic materials such as burnt flint. Optically stimulated luminescence can even be used in certain sediments containing archaeological material, such as deposits in northern Australian rock shelters dated to 53,000 to 60,000 years ago, crucial evidence for the early arrival of humans on that continent. Electron spin resistance can be used on humans and animal teeth for periods far outside the range of C14, for example from Israeli sites up to 100,000 years ago. There are many other lesser dating methods which are far too complex and too boring to explain here. In any case, archaeologists do not really need to know much about them, since most of them have difficulty understanding the scientific principles behind the pedal bin. They have a touching and often misplaced faith in the ability of the boffins, the hard scientists, to take the samples of material provided and produce a suitable set of dates. One's confidence in the laboratory is not helped by the fact that, when submitting a sample for radiocarbon dating, one is usually asked to say in advance what kind of figure is expected. Nevertheless, as long as archaeologists know the rudiments about the methods about which methods exist and the materials and age range to which they are applicable, they can simply concentrate on more important issues like seeking sealed and undisturbed contexts, taking samples with extreme care, avoiding contamination, and raising the often considerable funds needed to pay the laboratories for the analyses. As any teenager knows too well, dates do not come cheap. This is the end of chapter two.